Hello, and you're most welcome to the RCSI My Health Lecture Series. My name is Professor Steve Kerrigan, and today we are going to discuss fertility and pregnancy health. The My Health Lecture Series explores a wide range of areas in health and well-being and brings together some of the leading healthcare experts in these fields with the goal of empowering people to make informed decisions about their own health and well-being. Whether trying to conceive for a while or just starting out, there is a lot to understand about fertility and pregnancy health. Today I'm joined by Professor Fergus Malone, Master of the Rotunda Hospital Dublin and Professor and Chairman in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology in RCSI. I'm also joined by Dr. Karen Flood, Senior Lecturer in Obstetrics and Gynaecology in RCSI and Consultant in Obstetrics and Gynaecology in the Rotunda Hospital. And finally, Dr. Edgar Mokanu, Subspecialist in Reproductive Medicine and Surgery in RCSI and Consultant Gynaecologist in the Rotunda Hospital here to discuss this topic in more detail. Edgar, I might come to you first. Let's start at the very beginning. When is the best time to get pregnant? Steve, thank you for uh, initiating this program, a wonderful initiative. I hope it's going to be a benefit to all the audience. Um, simply speaking, there's no ideal time uh, to, get, to get pregnant. Each individual um, couple will decide depending on their life circumstances. Uh, I would say it is ideal when one starts thinking about having a child that they pursue this. Um, it is very true that education on the physiology of reproduction is very limited. So if you're to talk about um, when during a female lifetime it's optimal to conceive, I would say somewhere between 30, 25 and 35, as both the chance to uh, conceive and the health of the pregnancy for the mother and child is optimal. If you're referring to when in a month is the peak fertility, um, basically around the time of ovulation is optimal, but this is not known unless one will have a scan. And how do men or women know if they are fertile? For the male, there are no specific indicators. Unless the male pursues a semen analysis test, which is a test that looks at the volume, the concentration of sperm, the, their ability to swim, their motility, and if they look healthy, uh, there are no uh, specific signs that one will be infertile. There are nevertheless certain pointers, particularly the past medical history. So if a male would have had trauma to their testicles or surgery, uh, or there is a risk of cystic fibrosis in the family, um, or they might have had, uh, let's say, a cancer diagnosis and uh, received chemotherapy, there are situations when they might think uh, that they're infertile. Uh, for the female, it's a bit easier as uh, if a female has regular periods, somewhere between 26 and 32 days, if, and in particular, if she experiences some um, egg white secretions middle of the month and maybe some discomfort left or right of her tummy, there will be um, good indicators that an egg is released and the possibility of a pregnancy exists. For the female, there are certain tests that can be timed one week before the next period is due, uh, measuring a hormone called progesterone, which allows um, a diagnosis. If the progesterone is high, there's a suggestion that an egg has been released and thus uh, uh, the woman is fertile. Of course, there are many other factors contributing things like the shape of the uterus, the uh, tubes, are they open or not? And they will all contribute towards this uh, state of being fertile. And can anything be done to promote fertility? Well, um, the state could support more women that want to have children. But uh, on a serious note, of course, um, individual, um, individuals, females and males, should take uh, fertility uh, and the ability to have a child very seriously. So optimizing general health, like no smoking, limiting the amount of alcohol to no more than six units uh, weekly, uh, do not use recreational drugs, and uh, no excessive exercise, for example, uh, will be a first step. Uh, also optimizing medical conditions, if somebody has diabetes, for example, or respiratory disease, or uh, cystic fibrosis for that, and maybe had a, um, a transplant, a pulmonary transplant, uh, optimizing their health before embarking on pregnancy is crucial. Maintaining normal weight, and we all have to accept there's a lot of people doing exercise uh, uh, nowadays, but maintaining a normal weight with a BMI less than 30, but also not being too thin are, again, um, 
a crucial uh, target. And I think seeing um, a doctor, seeing a specialist in the area, particularly when uh, some medical background exists and seeing that person early. And what are the main causes of infertility in men and women? I will start uh, with men um, and um, a history of uh, previous conditions, as I've already mentioned, like cancer therapy or even mumps, for example, um, uh, or uh, previous infections might affect the uh, transport of sperm from the testicle to the outside world. That could be hormonal factors in the male where the stimulation of the testicle doesn't happen. Uh, there could be a situation where there's no sperm being produced whatsoever called testicular failure, um, and that will require um, treatment uh, straight away. There could be genetic conditions, and there could be abnormalities in general that range from no sperm at all to maybe uh, fine abnormalities like genetic material in the sperm head not being of good quality, which can be treated. And of course, the recreational uh, use of recreational drugs, uh, obesity, smoking, and so on. For the females, uh, anatomical, a female might be born with uh, an unusual shaped uterus. She might have actually two half uteruses. Uh, she might um, have two vaginas, for example. There could be endocrine abnormalities where the stimulation of this egg growth does not happen appropriately. Uh, polycystic ovaries, which is a growth misnomer. Uh, there's no such thing as polycystic. These are just ovaries that contain a lot of eggs, but due to the um, hardened surface of the ovary, the egg cannot be released every month. A condition that is rarely diagnosed is also endometriosis in women. And um, there are a lot of young girls that suffer with very painful periods and they don't go to seek advice. And I think this is an area where more awareness need to be placed um, in schools, in high schools, wherever girls um, are educated. Uh, last but not least, tubal disease is also important, although not very common, particularly in Ireland. And how does a woman know if she needs IVF? And related to that, I guess, when should a couple consider this as an option? The vast majority of um, infertility can be treated effectively without IVF. Um, the key is to receive an appropriate investigation uh, set and uh, fix the problem that has been diagnosed. Um, yet, as you said, IVF in vitro fertilization, basically bringing the sperm and the egg in a test tube and allowing them to interact, uh, hopefully uh, creating an embryo that is then placed inside the uh, woman's uterus. So um, in IVF, um, the natural process of conception uh, is taken out of the female body. So for the woman, if a patient would have had uh, two ectopic pregnancies when both tubes have been removed, she has no chance to conceive naturally. So IVF is an immediate indication. Uh, similarly, if she has very severe advanced endometriosis, stage four endometriosis, where everything is um, gelled together, the ability of the tube to pick up the egg and bring it to the sperm is not there. So that will be, again, an immediate indication for um, IVF. Um, for um, the female in a, a very unusual scenario, but that's possible too, where let's say that she has lost the uterus due to whatever condition, it might be a cervical cancer that was caught early and um, the uterus was removed, there is still a possibility to have IVF using the eggs from her ovaries uh, and the sperm from her partner and use surrogacy, which is not um, a, a treatment that is easily available in Ireland, uh, but it can be done abroad. For the, for the male, it is obvious that if the male doesn't have any um, semen in the ejaculate, the only opportunity is to have a biopsy, extract the sperm, and then use interventions such as ICSI or ICSI. Um, and in general, whenever all the treatments that have been offered to a couple that don't have these conditions I mentioned, when those treatments have failed, uh, IVF is there to try to take the eggs from inside the female's ovaries and meet them with the sperm outside the body and help them procreate. So um, lack of ovulation, uh, failure of previous therapies, and so on. Okay, thanks for that, Edgar. Let's go over to Karen now. So assuming that a woman is pregnant, what can she expect in early pregnancy? 
Hi, Steve. Thank you for um, asking me to take part in this initiative. So when a woman is pregnant, um, her body is going to undergo a lot of changes. So there's a lot of new symptoms that she might experience in the first trimester. And the commonest one is actually fatigue. So she'll feel her need for rest to increase. Um, other common symptoms are the frequent need to urinate, breast tenderness, and then there's a wide spectrum of nausea and vomiting. So it's called morning sickness, but should probably be called all day sickness. So some people experience nothing. Um, it doesn't mean the pregnancy is not healthy, they're just very lucky. And then we have other women who have on the more extreme side that they have a lot of nausea and a lot of vomiting that affects their kind of daily function. Um, for the general women, we usually recommend plain regular food to keep hydrated. But in extreme cases, we may need to prescribe medication or they may need to come to hospital for um, IV hydration. But that's usually the, um, the exception rather than the normality. Um, other kind of common symptoms that people aren't aware of would be things like bloating and constipation, nasal congestion, um, and also mood changes as well. So um, there's a lot of changes in your body in the, in the very early stages of pregnancy. Um, but obviously, if there's any problems, just make sure that you make contact with your obstetrician or general practitioner to make sure that there's nothing abnormal in what you're experiencing. And how can you keep yourself and your baby healthy during pregnancy? Well, the simplest approach really is to maintain a relatively healthy diet um, and to maintain exercise. From a diet perspective, make sure it's balanced. Um, obviously, that's hard when you're, if you have a bit of nausea, um, but that will increase or, I suppose, improve as the pregnancy progresses. Um, of all the supplementation, folic acid is probably the most important, um, but vitamin D and omega-3 and different vitamins are recommended also. So in your diet, um, there are certain foods to avoid. I think most people know this at this stage, but um, any raw or undercooked meats or poultry or eggs, um, and also um, anything unpasteurized from a dairy perspective. Um, there are some foods that um, are fine. Um, like seafood is fine once it's cooked outside the shell. Um, a lot of people think that they can't have peanut butter during pregnancy, but once you don't have a pre-existing allergy, this is absolutely fine. Regarding exercise, we do recommend that you maintain an exercise program. Um, certainly if you're somebody who exercise pre-pregnancy, so if you run or jog normally, it's okay to maintain this. As a general rule, we recommend that the intensity is reduced a little bit so that you're able to talk through your exercise and um, that you don't overheat and also that um, you maintain hydration pre-exercise pre and after exercise also. Is there anything else outside of food and exercise that a woman can or can't do during pregnancy? Well, obviously, like Edgar said, to maintain health, um, you want to avoid smoking and obviously alcohol is not recommended in pregnancy. Um, but there are, are a lot of other things you're allowed to do in pregnancy that people don't know about. So certainly um, hair dye is fine um, and also fake tan if you have an event. A lot of people worry about the toxic uh, chemicals in these products, but you'd have to ingest these in huge amounts to affect the baby. So they are absolutely fine. Um, we do recommend, I know from a mental health perspective, to maintain the exercise, as I say, um, but things like Pilates and yoga are also very, very beneficial to women. Great. I think that's great. What is the risk of miscarriage? Unfortunately, about 15% of pregnancies do end in miscarriage. Um, it's very hard to cause a miscarriage, and usually it's because of a genetic issue that's a, by chance, bad luck. Um, the good news is that the chance of occurrence is only about 2% for the next pregnancy, so we usually recommend after a miscarriage is managed that it's okay to proceed with the pregnancy after next, next normal cycle. Um, it may depend on how the miscarriage is actually managed. Um, so it can either be managed expectantly where you wait for nature to do its thing, or you may be given medication to bring on the miscarriage, or very occasionally you might do a DNC, and this might be recommended by based on the scan findings. Um, most women um, don't experience a miscarriage in their lifetime, but unfortunately about two to 3% of couples do experience three miscarriages and the chance event is, is kind of superseded by a possible underlying uh, problem and at this stage then we do proceed to investigations and those investigations would, would consider looking at the anatomy of the uterus and whether there's any clotting issue for the mum or whether there's any background hormonal imbalance um, and also whether there's an inherited genetic issue uh, from mum and dad but again these etiologies are very very rare and the majority of people even if they've experienced one miscarriage they want to have a healthy pregnancy. Is bleeding in pregnancy common? Unfortunately, it is because um, uh, it's, it occurs in about 30% of pregnancies, and it's probably the commonest reason why uh, pregnant women, especially in the first trimester, attend the emergency room. Um, but thankfully, over 90% um, uh, go on to have a healthy pregnancy. So it doesn't mean that it's going to proceed to a miscarriage. Uh, however, it is worthwhile to attend the early pregnancy units of whatever hospital you're attending or indeed the emergency room to obtain an early scan to, uh, to confirm that the pregnancy is ongoing and healthy.
That's great, Karen. Thank you. Moving along to Fergal now. So we've learned about fertility and getting pregnant and how to stay healthy during pregnancy. And now it's time for scans. Should a woman have an early scan in pregnancy? And what does an early dating scan really tell us? Well, Steve, it's absolutely essential, I think, that all pregnant women should have a scan early in pregnancy. It's hugely important for, as Karen just mentioned, the risk of miscarriage to reassure people early on that they don't actually have a miscarriage. And the positive benefits that that will give patients in early pregnancy are superb or very important. Secondly, it's really important that obstetricians and midwives know exactly how far along your pregnancy is. So, for example, later things that we do in pregnancy, such as glucose testing for diabetes, or indeed later in pregnancy, there might be a decision needed on whether to induce labor or not, or a decision might be needed as to when a cesarean section might be performed. That's all dependent entirely on knowing exactly what the due date is. And you'll know what the due date is much more precisely if you've had a scan early in pregnancy. And then finally, and not uncommonly, we see regularly patients with a surprising diagnosis of twins or even higher in early pregnancy. As many as one or two percent of all pregnancies nowadays end up with multiple gestations, mostly because many patients are a little bit older now when they get pregnant or indeed um, they see um, specialists like Edgar who does assistance with fertility. And because of fertility assistance, you see a lot more patients with multiple gestations. And it's really important that those potentially high risk pregnancies are identified early on. So for all those reasons, absolutely essential that a scan is done in all pregnancies and as early as possible, typically around seven to eight weeks. Do many people not have a scan that early? No, there's still lots of places. It's hard to get in for a scan. And um, now it's improving a lot oh. now that the 19 maternity units all have early pregnancy assessment units. But still, um, it's, it, it can still take a while to get in for a scan. And how can you tell if the baby is normal from a scan, Fergal? It's absolutely essential that all pregnant women have uh, what people call the anatomy scan or the anomaly scan or the big scan, which is typically done at around 20 to 22 weeks gestation. That's far enough along that the baby is big enough that we can look at all of the various organs in the body and confirm that they look normal. For example, one to two, one percent of all babies uh, end up being born with a heart defect. And it's really important that people know about that in advance so the pediatricians are ready to provide best care for the baby. There's no way you'll know about that unless you've had a scan, typically at 20 to 22 weeks. Similarly, Many patients will have a baby with a kidney or a bladder problem, um, or indeed a spine problem or a problem with the, with the lips, all of which are really important to know about in advance because we can optimize the care for the mother and her baby as soon as the baby is born. And needless to say, for anyone who's unlucky enough to have a baby with a congenital abnormality, it's so much more important for them to know about it in advance so they have a chance to prepare, they have a chance to have all of the various pediatric specialists lined up and get their baby started in the best possible way. Thanks for that, Fergal. Should every woman have a screening test for abnormalities? Well, the short answer to that, Steve, is yes. Um, many women uh, will be aware that as they get older, their chances of having babies with certain genetic abnormalities, things like Down syndrome, Edwards syndrome, trisomy 13, get higher. But we know that the vast majority of women who are pregnant are actually younger than 35. So even though the individual 40-year-old, for example, has a much higher risk of having a baby with Down syndrome than the individual 25-year-old, there's a lot more 25-year-olds having babies than 40-year-olds. So if you limit or restrict screening tests for conditions like that just to women above a certain age, for example, 35, you will miss the majority of cases of genetic chromosomal abnormalities. So for that reason, our practice in the last decade or so has evolved so that we now recommend that every pregnant woman should consider having a screening test for genetic abnormalities like Down syndrome or Edwards syndrome. And the good news is that our technology has evolved significantly in the last while in this regard. So typically at around nine to 10 weeks gestation, we can do a simple blood test from a woman's arm. So no risk with it, just a blood test. And obviously floating around in the woman's blood is her own DNA. But we now know that floating around in her blood is tiny amounts of the baby's DNA. And there are a number of specialist labs that we work with 
that they can take that blood sample and separate out the mother's DNA from the baby's DNA and give a very strong predictive value, a very strong likelihood that their baby will be genetically healthy without any of those conditions or unfortunately might have one of those conditions. So tremendously accurate, done as early as nine or 10 weeks gestation. And all pregnant women really should consider whether or not that's a suitable test for them. And what is the role for ultrasound later in pregnancy, Fergal? Well, ultrasound is really important for the general provision of, of obstetric care even later in pregnancy. So for example, in some cases we'll find that the woman's uterus doesn't feel as large as it should be and the baby might not be growing well. So it'd be very important to be able to do an ultrasound in that situation to confirm that there's no problem with the placenta and the baby's growing well. In other cases, a patient might have their placenta might be a little bit low in the uterus and might get in the way of the baby coming out. It's really important to know about that later in pregnancy, in particular if the patient presents with bleeding. And then sometimes near the end of a pregnancy, a patient will present to the emergency department with um, a reduction in fetal movement. She has a general sense that the baby isn't moving as much as she's used to. And in that situation, it's really important that the patient very promptly and without any delay comes to the emergency department so we can confirm that everything is well. And for the vast majority of patients, it's just simply a matter of doing a quick scan, confirm that the fluid around the baby is normal and the baby is moving well. And then finally, sometime near the very end of a pregnancy, it may be unclear, is the baby's head coming down first? Or maybe the baby is lying with the bum first, which we call breech. And in that situation, it's really important to know about that rather than waiting to diagnose that when the patient is in the throes of labour. Thanks for that, Fergal. OK, we're just about out of time. Karen, what is the main take home message you would like to leave everyone with? I suppose, Steve, I suppose just, just for women to re realise that pregnancy is a normal uh, state um, and it's very important to keep as normal, as healthy as possible with a good diet uh, and maintaining exercise. And um, there's a great a website as a resource called the First of Thousand Days and it gives great nutritional advice for pre-pregnancy um, nutrition and also during pregnancy and postpartum and then importantly for breastfeeding afterwards. Um, for women who are uh, was unfortunate to experience a miscarriage, there's a great resource as well called Miscarriage Association of Ireland. And they, lot of, they offer a lot of support and also links for different websites. It might help them on their journey um, before they become pregnant. Fergal, what is the main take home message that you would like to leave everybody with? I think it's really important that every pregnant woman feels empowered to ask their obstetrician, to ask their midwife for scans or screening tests to confirm fetal health. Um, these tests are generally available, uh, provided you know to ask for them and to ensure you understand the benefits of those. For example, at rccifetalcenter.ie or ev.ie, evie.ie, you can get information on what these screening tests are, how you can get scans and tests to confirm that your baby is doing well. Edgar, what is the main take home message you would like to leave everyone with today? In my opinion, um, nearly everybody has a life plan and includes uh, education, career, uh, buying a car, a house, and entering a relationship. And sometimes along the, this uh, road, the idea of having a baby somehow disappears. So my advice would be to schedule your babies early in your life's diary. Um, to follow up on what my colleagues have mentioned, uh, for resources on fertility, and education for patients, I would recommend the HFEA, Human Fertility and Embryology Authority website. Similarly, on the North American continent, the ASRM, American Society for Reproductive Medicine, which has a patient dedicated um, chapter, and also the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology, ESHRA. Thanks for that, Edgar, and all of your observations. There is some really useful information in there so that concludes our discussion today, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. My sincere thanks to our panelists, Dr. Edgar Mokenu, Dr. Karen Flood, and Professor Fergal Malone. The next event in the My Health series will focus on living well with multiple sclerosis, which will air on Monday, the 24th of May. You can find out more information about this and the other events in the My Health series on the RCSI website. Thank you for listening. Stay safe.